Like I remember putting off Orgo lab reports and my roommate and I would just like go to the common room until like four in the morning. I like take a ton of Red Bull and Monster, just like down that throughout the night, write these lab reports, wake up four hours later, go to Orgo lab, come back <laughs> and crash on a Friday and then wake up Saturday morning. <laughs> Welcome, friends. Welcome back to another episode of College Winter Views. I am joined by my friend, Mahesh. That's nice. Mahesh That's a good title. Uh, Mahesh is looking, thank you. He's looking hella formal because he just came out of a class. Mahesh is actually a teacher. So he's a recent grad, just like me. And we're going to figure out what this guy has been up to. So, Mahesh, where did you go to school? And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? All right. Um... So I went to school with Kevin at Exeter. That's where we met and became friends. And from there, I went to Georgetown. Oh, actually, let me change my name real quick. So uh, I'm not Mr. Kumar still. I'm off the <laughs> clock right now. And at Georgetown, I like went in gung-ho about being pre-med mm -hmm. and really like began to change my perspective up a little bit there about what I wanted to do and like how I wanted to do it. And then I guess kind of just like spent a lot of time soul searching through college. Like I realized- okay. I thought I'd grown a lot at Exeter, but it, it changed a lot since then. All right. Now, now, now here comes the interesting stuff. So you were pre-med. Are you still pre-med? Right. Like what changed yeah. your mind? What kinds of instances or experiences kind of made you challenge your, your plan or your, where you were heading? For sure. Um, so I am still pre-med, or I guess post <laughs> pre-med. Uh, I'm like going to medical school. I'm applying this cycle. So I'm like in the process of hearing back from schools uh, right now. I am still like... When I went to Georgetown, I was like 100% going down the pre-med path. Like, let me put my nose to the grindstone and just get through college so that I can go straight to medical school. Uh, but pretty early on in my time at Georgetown, I had a teacher who really, like, really exposed me to the extent of education inequity in America. And that's where I really like began to recognize my privilege, which is something kind of insane to say, having come from a place like Exeter. Like, obviously, we were in a bubble. Um, <laughs> but like once I left Exeter and had that exposure to like students from all different backgrounds coming to college, that's when I really like recognized the extent of that privilege. And that's when I began to think about teaching. And I just remember like there being students in my class who hadn't had any science curriculum in high school or had never had like a lab based science course in high school. And then they were now like pre-meds at Georgetown. And it just seems so surprising to me that students who had never had any of these opportunities would still find a passion in STEM and come to a school specifically to be pre-med. And just like the idea that if there are students who didn't have science, period, like think about how many more people would be able to enter the STEM field had they like gotten that exposure at a younger age. And that's sort of why I started changing trajectory. Wow. Okay. Well, I guess, uh, Mr. Kumar, let's dive into your <laughs> teaching experience. Well, sure. you know, the funny thing is we, Mahesh and I go way back and one of my favorite memories, should I say favorite? Okay. It was both favorite and kind of torturous where Mahesh and I would be on a, on a video call, actually extremely similar <laughs> to the one that we're on right now. <laughs> I'm taken aback to like what 10th grade Mahesh and Kevin, there was a AP chemistry class, chemistry 319. 319. Yes. And Mahesh and I would be calling each other at 2 a.m., like trying to discuss this problem set because we had no idea what was going on. Um, yeah, that and was horrible. It was, it was so hard. We were like two blind mice trying to teach each other. It was, it was kind of funny, real. Um, but a true bonding experience. But um, Mahesh has a, has a real knack for, particularly when it came to biology and some of the other sciences, but just kind of like reading it once. And I felt like this man ate the page and understood it perfectly. <laughs> and then he could explain it to me. Meanwhile, I would teach him a thing or two about writing. So it was a, what many was it things called? Too. It's like mutually, isn't there a biological term for that? Oh, uh, symbiotic know. relationship. That's <laughs> okay. So Mahesh, your teaching experience, like when did you have your first foray into teaching? I don't even think I know this. Yeah. And then, like, I mean, how like, long I have you been teaching? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oh, I would sorry. consider my first like attempt at teaching Chem 319, you and me on these late night Zoom calls. That's like teaching arguably it was really just like the blind leading the blind and then like biology and then whatever came after that and we kept on doing those video calls but then at Georgetown after my freshman year I was like looking for ways to teach or tutor and I was able to become a writing center tutor which is ironic considering <laughs> you were the one who carried me through English throughout high school 
but I was a writing center tutor for three years. And then Georgetown also had this really cool program through the biology department where I could go to a local high school and teach a science class at that school for a semester, uh, or actually for a whole year. So my entire senior year, I was student teaching. Um, my current roommate, actually, he was a friend of mine from a summer class that we took at Georgetown. And then we taught together that one year. And now we're teaching it together again in Newark, New Jersey. So yeah, I've been okay. teaching now, I guess, two years, technically, one of them gotcha. online. And um, yeah, tell us, tell us more, like, what is a typical day in the life of teacher Kumar? What does that look like? What subjects do you teach? And then maybe if there's any particular stories or experiences about you with the kids, I, I mean, I, I would be so curious and would love to hear that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so my typical day, so because we're online, everything is very different. And because online schooling was never something that anyone had planned for or had, been, had ever even considered as like a solution to anything, we're really like stumbling along and trying to figure it out as we go. And that those first like two or three months of the school year were absolutely brutal. We were like, how do we get people to come to class? I mean, we're still arguing about that one. Uh, also, <laughs> like, how do we stop people from Zoom bombing? Uh, how do we... What's that? What's Zoom, Zoom bombing, bombing is like when someone just <laughs> bursts into a room and then like shouts things off of mute and then leaves. Yeah, it's super disrespectful, especially when they say like super inappropriate stuff. We're just like, pretend that we didn't hear anything, hit them on mute and then like kick them out of the room. But then like we, we had to develop a strategy around that. And then also like what happens to students who don't have Wi-Fi? So I chose, uh, or so Newark is a very diverse and economically underserved or economically disadvantaged community on a, as a whole. And a lot of our students don't have access to like secure Wi-Fi or strong enough Wi-Fi for them and their siblings to be on Zoom. So we had to figure out solutions around that. We also had to provide computers to everyone. Uh, so there were a lot of hoops to jump through to get things started. But I think we're finally like entering a rhythm, you know, with only like three months left. And our day-to-day -day is actually really chill. We have classes from 8.30 to about two o'clock. And uh, one of those classes is async every day. So we have students come in, log into a Zoom room, but it's really like a glorified study hall. So we'll sit there answering any questions they might have, which is honestly my favorite part. Like teaching is a lot of fun, but when you're like specifically working one on one with someone and answering their questions and getting that like direct live feedback, I think it's a lot more rewarding because you can see that growth happening in real time, which is a lot of fun. And then I also meet a lot of great students like Homer, who uh, you also, I also introduced to you, which is one of the best parts, I think. School is, school is fun, teaching is fun, but the best parts are like in office hours when you're with your students and you're just like distracted. I, uh, I was having a conversation last week about like springs at the beginning of our class. And then somehow we transitioned to Dragon Ball Z. And for an hour and a half, my students were just like talking about this, this Dragon Ball app that they were playing games on and competing with one another. And I was like, I have no idea what this is up about. I haven't watched the show. But I was just like sitting there and like listening to them talk. And it was definitely a better hour and a half than I could have spent like playing video games on my own. Oh man, that's so cute. And what age range you're teaching high schoolers? Yeah, so I'm teaching ninth grade, ninth grade physics. Yeah. Ninth grade physics now. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, all right, let's rewind a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, Mahesh. And there's another really cool experience that I wanted you to talk about, which was studying abroad. And honestly, just being like a student at Georgetown, like, what was oh, that yeah, like? Sure. Did you find the academics difficult? What was your major? Um, you know, how many hours a, a day or a week were you studying? Maybe you can walk us through that guy, yeah. and how he lived like three years ago. <laughs> For sure. I don't know if I was the model student in college. Um, I was a neurobiology <laughs> major, which is a lot, it sounds fancier than it was. It was really just like, looking at the brain but at a molecular level which was actually really cool because it just built on what we were learning in our regular biology classes and I also took a lot of genetics classes that sort of extended from the genetics course that we had in high school but I was not the model student because I was big on cramming in college I think I'm gonna have to change up come medical school because I don't remember anything and I kind of need to as a doctor I would imagine but like my week would just be I'd be in class for like maybe in the beginning it was like five hours a day. And then as we got high to higher grades, it was like one or two hours a day. And then I would just be in classes. Then I'd do my readings like in the hour before class, come up with some questions to ask. And then studying, I would like really just dedicate the weekend before a test to cramming everything I would need to know into that, uh, into that two day period. And then if I were like to work on an essay, I'd also do that the night before and then just pull an all nighter until it was due. So not the most ideal student, but I think part of that was because I felt so well prepared going into college that like first year, that or the first semester really, I like 
was a lot more on top of my stuff. And then I was like, oh, I could ease back a little bit and I think still do well enough. So I just like took my foot off the gas, but I really don't know like what else I was doing. I was just like enjoying being in DC. I was like learning a lot more about policy, meeting new people who were like very, very different from me. Like even within the biology department, which is pretty much where all of my friends were, we had people who were like environmental biology majors, people who were like general biology majors or molecular and uh, like molecular biology majors or microbiology majors. Wow. I so there were I got so all these different, different flavors kinds of, of majors bio. of biology. Yeah. yeah, it was. Um, so all my friends are just like different sects of bio, which was always really cool. And then it was just a really nice way to like have time to spend with a bunch of different people. Cool. Now, yeah. correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but I think you, at one point, I think you casually dropped that, like you had a really high GPA. So your grades were still like pretty good, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I did well. <laughs> I, um, my like worst class was Orgo 1, but that was, that was the only class I like was disappointed in my grade in. Gotcha. So for the most part, your, your little cramming strategy worked. Well, you know, before yeah. before you answer that, I gotta admit that I did the same exact thing when I got I to college. Know. Like, you know, I don't wanna blame Mahesh and I certainly don't wanna blame myself. I think that part of the reason we evolved and got comfortable with this kind of strategy is because the way that college works, guys, it's not like high school where you have tests every two weeks or things happen more frequently. You just have like a giant big midterm and then a final. And so, for several weeks, like you might just be chilling and there's no real major assignments. There's no real pressure. Um, and as it turns out, like you can, you can memorize everything before like the midterm or final, if you have a lot of caffeine and kind of cram uh, a day or two before. And that's when everyone else has like study guides and they're passing them around. So like I did take some classes that were like language classes at Yale. And I thought those were the best well taught because we met every day. And then also we had tests every two weeks. So it was like always on your toes. It was the most similar to high school, to be honest. And I think because of that, I retained like a ton more information. But some of the more, you know, classes where you just write one final paper end of semester, which may or may not have to do with the readings that you read. Sometimes they're just like research projects and you can do whatever you want. Um, yeah, but honestly, yeah. like those were the best classes. The <laughs> ones where you like had a whole semester of reading and then the final essay was like, choose whatever you want to talk about. And you're like, oh, I only need to read one work, one week's worth of material. Perfect. Yeah. That's that's the kind of class that you turn to your your roommate and you're like, dude, we need to sign up for this class like this semester. Yeah. Like, please do this with me. So yeah, those cl classes like that exist, and of course, then you have classes like Orgo, which is very rigid and like you got to learn everything. Yeah. All right. So, would you say that like your Georgetown academic experience was easy, or like what do you? I would on like that? I think for the most part, yeah. I don't think it was necessarily too. It wasn't hard, but it was challenging. Like I still felt like there were moments of productive struggle. That's like one of those teacher words. Uh, productive struggle is like where you're still like not quite understanding the material super easily, but you like can get through it on your own or with a mm. peer or with someone you're like working with. Mm -hmm. And I think like, that when was, was that? like, when was I in that productive struggle? <laughs> yeah. Like when we're deep in the brain talking about like the basal, uh, basal ganglion motor loop or something like that. And we're like trying to figure out like if you mess with the dopamine receptors in this part of the brain, what happens in another part of the brain? And it's just like following out these different steps. Trust me, I couldn't answer that question now because again, these were all in those like three days before a test. This is the problem with cramming. You don't remember it long-term. So yeah. as a teacher, I feel like I have to endorse the fact that you should study interspersedly throughout, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, throughout the quarter. But like, for let's sure, be real, that's sure. not gonna happen. But yeah, those moments of productive struggle were great. I also like those memories at Exeter when we were like on Zoom late at night, those were like mm -hmm. the, some of the, like while they were not ideal, those are still some of my strongest memories from Exeter. That's true. I think the same thing was true of Georgetown. Like I remember putting off Orgo lab reports and my roommate and I would just like go to the common room until like four in the morning, I, like take a ton of Red Bull and Monster, just like down that throughout the night, write these lab reports, wake up four hours later, go to Orgo lab, come back <laughs> and crash on a Friday and then wake up Saturday morning. It was just I love like- the, I love the honesty here, man. This is, I, yeah. and you know what? Like. <laughs> We, we've all been through it. Like, I feel, yeah. like, I feel like it's rare to ask a college student who hasn't done that at least once. Um, yeah. For me, it was like memorizing tons of terms for humanities, uh, like medieval Chinese philosopher <laughs> course. I, was, that, I had to memorize like 50 of them. Um, but anyways, yeah, that's, that's great. Productive struggle. I mean, these days, I, you know, I teach a lot virtually over Zoom. My kids are, end up being a little bit more financially privileged, which is why I'm looking for like more financial aid kids. Um, but yeah, spacing, interleaving, those kinds yeah. of concepts, like they, they really help you memorize stuff. So 
I wish that we had learned more about that, right? I think it's called uh, not, like how to study. Yeah, metacognition, right? Learning about language, oh yeah, metacognition. Sort of thing. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, I also right. like the study group is the biggest trick. I think like having a study group and like also finding a study group where you're like not the smartest person in the room, but you're also not the worst student in the room. That way you like have some things you can teach, but you also have someone you can ask questions to. I really think like teaching someone else is the best way to learn new material, which yeah. is really like how we got through Chem 319 together. <clears throat> we would each yeah, like understand one thing and then try to, try to teach it together. Yeah, hundred percent. I, rem I remember the things we struggled on. Like I remember the oleic acid lab too. That, would, that was killer. I remember like <laughs> the, um, there was like an electric that had to do with chemistry as well in the spring. Um, and I remember like studying nephrons in the kidney with Chisholm. Like I literally oh, am haunted yeah. by those memories now. Um, all right, well, let's talk about something happier. Let's talk about something happier. <laughs> so Mr. Kumar, you left Georgetown, <laughs> which at times was fun, at times was not so fun. And you ended up going to a very foreign place, exotic, some might say. You went to Australia <laughs> and you studied right, abroad right. there. How did that happen? Why did you study abroad? Well, what motivated you to do that? Did you enjoy it? Um, yeah, tell us about that yeah. experience. So <laughs> again, after like my freshman year, that's when I really like started okay. considering going into teaching. Mm -hmm. And I was like looking for places that had, I like knew I wanted to study abroad. I was like, I lived in America all my life. And when am I ever going to have an opportunity to spend like a long period of time in a foreign country? Now I was limited by the fact that I only speak, like I barely speak French. <laughs> I like just passed out of like intermediate to French. Uh, so I was limited by that. So I could only go like, French speaking countries or English speaking countries. And then I was like, let me go to the most exotic place or exotic place I could think of. And I put it in air quotes because while like Australia is very untamed and it's like incredibly different in terms of wildlife, it's really just America with an accent and fewer weapons. Like the people are nicer. That's also a big plus. And their, their public transportation system is nicer, but like it felt a lot like I was in America and except for the fact that like on any given weekend, I could go to a national park that was like within a 20 minute train ride. So I like chose Australia because it was just like, there was so much new wildlife that I could explore. Um, and I was like bio nerd on the side. <laughs> so mm. I could still like try and explore these different like flora and fauna. And that was a really cool aspect about being in Sydney that I was like really appreciative of, but I really chose it because it had such a strong education program. And it was really interesting seeing like, cause you know, the University of Sydney or rather schools not in America tend to like have students live at home and then come to classes. It's not like a dorm based system. So there were like thousands upon thousands of students. So Georgetown's a small school and I guess thousands upon thousands is not really right. It's probably like 10,000 upon 10,000 students at the University of Sydney. So our like lecture hall would be like 200, 300 students learning about education, but it was still like such an engaging class that I really, like, I was taking um, social perspectives on education and mm -hmm. then global perspectives of poverty and education. So it was like, how does education shape our culture and how does it shape our society and then also how does it lead to like the perpetuation of poverty in certain countries so it's really interesting to like not only look at that in an australian context but also to bring like my experience in america back to or with me to australia and then think about how these issues are playing out back home and how they're sort of influencing what's going on uh in the american education system so i really enjoyed that part of it and i still like keep in contact with a lot of my sydney friends which is really cool so I like also had this pipe dream of wanting to go back to Australia. I say it's like a pipe dream because I'm like locked into school in America for the next eight years. But then one day I will go back and live there for some time. But Australia was, was a dream. Although New Zealand is the place to go. If you had to choose between the two, mm -hmm. New Zealand, that place was untapped paradise. Mm -hmm. That's what I felt when I went there. Do you have like a specific memory from Australia? Maybe like a story that, that, yeah, that this you is remember? Like, yeah, go ahead. Not going to portray my roommate or I in the best light, but... Um, Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So there was like this one particular attraction. Attraction. It was like a natural feature that's called the figure eight pools. It's like a tide tidal pool. Because like Sydney's on the coast. Pretty much everyone in Australia lives on the coast. There's a natural national park with a specific like attraction there called the tide, the, uh, the figure eight pools. And my roommate were like, and I were like, let's go there. Uh, we could use some good Instagram photos. Let's let's set up a photo shoot. So we were like, all right, on Saturday morning, we'll leave at 8 p.m., hop on the train, head over there. It was like an hour long train ride. Naturally, Saturday rolls around. We wake up at 11. I'm like, OK, so we already missed that time. We can probably still make this work. So we like take another half hour to an hour to get ready. And then like, we finally make it to the train station. Neither of us had actually checked the train timeline. We got on the train. We were fortunate, like there was a train there, but 
once we got closer to like this stop we were supposed to get off of, there was like maintenance along the tracks. So they stopped us like three stops early, which was easily like eight miles away from where we were supposed to go. So we like get off the train and we're like, well, we're not going to go back now. So we just start walking. We're like walking along this forest road, which is actually absolutely gorgeous. They were like, again, all these different trees that you wouldn't see here and a lot of different like wildlife. We saw a wallaby, which is really just like a mini kangaroo, but it was, oh. it was cool to see nonetheless. And we were just like wandering along the road and my roommate's like, listen, I got a shortcut. We can just go through this forest off the road and there's a stream right ahead. If we follow that, we'll get right there. So we like start climbing through like the foliage or through like the, the forest. And it's just the worst experience ever. There's like a ton of, of like bristly plants. We're getting scratched up because <laughs> we're always wearing shorts because it's so nice there. Um, and we never get to the stream. We just keep on going uphill. I don't know how we could possibly consistently be going uphill, but we never make it there. And I'm just like, listen, it's been an hour and a half. We're nowhere. In the, we're literally in the middle of nowhere. I was like, we need to get back to the road and then just keep on making our way to this, this pool. He was like, all right, all right, you're right. And I was like, first of all, you are also never going to be allowed to uh, navigate. <laughs> and we'd also finished our water by then. So we were struggling. We were in a bad place. We're back on the road now, walking still uphill somehow. I don't know uh, where we were, but we chose the worst place to, uh, to hike. But we were like easily four hours away from the, the tide pools. And it was like 2 or 3 p.m. And we were like, there's no chance we get there before the sun sets. So we start like hitchhiking. We were like, I'd never... The thought of hitchhiking would never cross my mind in America. There are too many crazy people with guns. But in Australia, there's like reasonable gun control and reasonable safety <laughs> laws. So we were just sticking out our thumb on the side of the road and just some random couple pulled up and they were like, hey, where are you guys from? And we're like, we're actually students from the US. We're here uh, staying in Chippendale, which is like the neighborhood we were in. And they're like, oh, we live in the town next door or next right over. And we we're like, oh, cool. <laughs> can, we, can you give us a ride? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, for sure. Hop into our car. And then they like drove us to the tide pools and it was awesome. It was just like, like hitchhiking was actually a lot of fun. We were just having a conversation about what their life in Australia was like. They were like, mm. yeah, we work during the week, but then we always go to some different beach on the weekends. I was like, that sounds honest, awesome, honestly. Like just being able to vacation from your home whenever you want. And their like quality of life in Australia was also really different, which was cool to see. But then we get to the, the tide pools and have our little photo shoot. And then our plan was to Uber back, but we were still in the middle of like a national forest. And it was dark by the time we like got to a spot, got back to the parking lot. <laughs> and when we looked for the Ubers, there were just like absolutely none. And they were like, you dummies, why would you possibly think there were Ubers out here? So we're like stumbling along a gravel road in the dark, trying to hitchhike again. And someone finally takes us like as far as the fork in the road. And this whole road we were driving down was like super bumpy and like very clearly not maintained. We we're like, there's mm. no way we would have gotten through this without breaking an ankle otherwise. But then we get to the fork in the road and then we have to find other people to hitchhike with. So we're just like hitchhiking back from car to car. And then finally, I think one Malaysian couple picked us up and we're like, where are you from? Uh, and then we're like, from the US, <laughs> where are you from? And they're like, we're from Malaysia. And then they started talking about like politics in Malaysia. <laughs> and we were just like nodding along like, oh yeah, that sounds awful. Or, oh yeah, what, a, what an issue. And he like dropped us off at the train station. It was, it was an adventure for sure. But moral of the story, Hitchhike if you can. That's somewhere. I, that's the first time I heard that one. It's crazy that you guys hitchhike there and back. You guys yeah. at least get some nice Instagram photos. Oh yeah, we got some great pictures. pictures. Yeah, I'll send you some. So how long were you in Australia for? Was it a semester or a year? Yeah, so it was a semester. I think so. Their semester started a little differently. They're on like a an offset schedule because they're in the southern hemisphere. So their second semester starts in July and ends in November. So I was there from July through December. I just like stayed a little bit longer went to uh, the Great Barrier Reef and then Melbourne. And then I went to New Zealand afterwards. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. I'm so jealous. Nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm dying to go. I can't wait. <laughs> I'll give you the itinerary. Yeah. Thank you. We, we do that sentimes. We share itineraries and uh, Mahesh ended yeah. up going to Thailand where Hiro yeah. and I and Tarun went. That was fun. Um, okay. Speaking about school. So medical school is coming up. Right. Um, do you know, like, what kind of doctor you want to be? Like, also, I, I guess I, I never asked you this question yet, but, like, why do you want to be a doctor? Are you still, you know, passionate about education, but still more passionate or more interested in, in medicine? Yeah. Yeah, so I, uh, I don't know what kind of doctor I want to be. And, like, growing up, I kind of just was, like, going through the motions of being a doctor. Like, my family, my dad's a doctor. My parents are, like, the stereotypical Indian parents where you have to become a doctor. Um, and my brother veered from that path. And he was the, he was the one, like, get out of jail free card we had. 
So he used it himself. So I kind of like had to be a doctor, or at least that's what I thought. And like, I began to build a passion for medicine, uh, for biology. And like, I think you noticed that at Exeter and then again at Georgetown. And I knew that was like a subject I was passionate about and something that I enjoyed. But then education started to take over and I like, began moving towards education more. And I was still like hoping to one day merge the two interests and find a way to like have medicine and education intersect and ultimately become like a more equitable form of medicine. That's just like more accessible in terms of like health clinic programming, more responsive to like actual patient needs and like mm -hmm. a lot more preventative care in communities that don't really get it. So I guess, I don't know what specific type of doctor I want to be, but I do know I want to be the type of doctor who's like pushing medicine to be more equitable. And I think living in Newark has helped me sort of appreciate the importance of that. Uh, living in DC at Georgetown, which is like another bubble of elite privilege, there were mm -hmm. very few people I knew who were affected by COVID. Whereas there are tons of people in Newark that I know uh, that have like lost family members to COVID. And it's a lot more of a, of a real like issue in the lives of people here. It's a lot more uh, impactful. And that's largely because of the, the huge health disparities that we have in our country. And I wanted to like do whatever I can to try and minimize those gaps. And Quamir actually wants to do the same, which is another reason why I think he and I connect so well. And it's awesome to see like, <clears throat> I know I'm so far out of the, like I'm still eight years away, which makes him 16 years away. But it's nice to see like there's a pipeline coming of, of passionate doctors who are passionate future doctors who want to like push that needle. That's super duper inspiring. That's great. <laughs> do you have um, any idea like where you want to go to medical school? Is, does it depend yeah, on so, the program mainly or does it depend on location? Yeah. What are you thinking? Yeah. So right now I actually I'm into you, Chicago. Um, oh, congratulations, and... <laughs> dude. I didn't know that. <laughs> thank sweet. you. Thank you. And I'm waiting to hear back from you, Penn. But I like, I'm at this point where I think UChicago is going to be the right path for me. It's a lot more social justice oriented, or at least very like UChicago is a smaller school, so they can like afford to direct themselves in one specific direction. And I think that just that direction that they're like dedicating most of their effort to is like promoting a more equitable form of medicine, which is exactly what I want to be doing. And it's exactly the path I want to take. So like, for that reason, it's like UChicago is my top choice. I was actually right before this call, I was like looking at different apartments in U like right around U Chicago, trying to find where I might live next year. But yeah, so I think that's the reason I want to go to U Chicago. But like the whole medical school journey is such a stressful process that I feel like yeah. I owe it to myself to see and hear out where else I'm going to get back. So I haven't committed yet officially, mm. but I think I'm going to go with U Chicago. Well, it's nice to know that that's the worst you can do at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true, true. And Mahesh is from Chicago, so. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah. That's the biggest concern, actually. <laughs> My parents might visit a little too often. Um, yeah, yeah. You want but I'll just, like, have to change the locks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Wow. This has been a really enlightening talk and inspiring, too, man. I didn't know you were so interested in education. I, of course, am really, really interested in education. I've always had this pipe, pipe tree. I've been saying that a lot. Um, but, yeah, this idea to teach kids skills that I think are like really, really crucial for uh, surviving in the real world, like personal finance. Sure. That's and... something we do not get at all in either high school or college, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah no, it's it is way crazy. too much about the brain to not know how to like balance a checkbook. No, it's ridiculous because like we literally went to like the best high school and some of the best colleges. And it's like, where, where was this information? Like I had to right. watch videos on YouTube to learn it. So, um, but yeah, I think the internet has really revolutionized education for sure, made it more equitable, yeah. but there's still, I mean, clearly, you know, a lot of your students don't even have internet connection or didn't have computers. So right. there's a lot more work to be done. All right, then. Well, Mahesh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy, yeah, anytime, Kev. busy day to come chat. And hopefully we can interview more Exonians. Hopefully we can interview more recent college grads. The whole goal of these college winter views, guys, is to get you guys exposed to, you know, what we, what, what might my, my, excuse me, what might my, what might my future look like in like four or five years? Um, and hopefully, you know, when I was in early high school, I didn't know any um, recent college grads or people who were in college. And I just desperately wish I had a chance to talk to them and pick their brain. So hopefully you guys can walk away from these talks um, with some takeaways. All right, then. Well, Mahesh, thanks again. And we'll yeah, catch sure. you guys at the next one. See you, Kev. Bye.